Amen. <clears throat> well, it's so good to see you today. I'm going to take a moment to welcome our campuses, those who are watching online, wherever you might be today. Come on, can you put your hands together and welcome your family? So glad that you are with us today, excited for what God's going to do in this place today. I hope you, you come with expectation, expectation today. And um, today is a special day, a couple reasons. Number one, uh, tonight begins our fall Zion City Revival Nights. And uh, it is, we started this uh, last year, kind of officially, and uh, it is a, an incredible time of gathering tonight. We're beginning with uh, Anna Golden. What, what a great name, by the way, like Golden. I'm Golden, yeah. Um, we are starting tonight with a night of worship. Anna Golden, some of you might know that name, but she is... Uh, Uh, just an incredibly effective, gifted worship leader. And so we're just beginning tonight by preparing the atmosphere for everything that God wants to do throughout this week. And if you're the kind of person who's like, well, I just come on Sunday morning. Listen, don't be that guy, okay? Come back on Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, whatever your schedule will will avail. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Tonight uh, is a worship night. Tomorrow night is Pastor Jeremy Johnson, uh, who pastors Fearless Church out of L.A., and uh, if, in case you don't know, he's the guy that looks like Jesus. That's what I tell people. Like, literally, someone said to me last year, like, hey, the pastor that looked like Jesus. I knew exactly who they were talking about because he has the long hair and the beard. And not only does he look like Jesus, he acts like Jesus, too. He's a good guy. So he'll be with us on Monday. Tuesday, Pastor Jabin Chavez is going to be with us. And uh, he is just an incredible communicator, pastor of the gospel. It's just amazing. He pastors a thriving, growing church in Las Vegas, Nevada. Listen, if you can build a growing, thriving church in Las Vegas, you're doing something right. Come on, somebody, right? And so you're going to love him. I'm telling you, he's one of my favorite, favorite preachers of the gospel. And then, of course, Wednesday night, we'll wrap it up with Pastor Samuel Rodriguez, uh, who is just unbelievable. Just amazing how God is using him around the globe. And I thought I was, I'm tired with one job. This guy has like 14 jobs. He's a movie producer, an executive producer, an incredible preacher of God's word. And and we, we just fell in love with him last year, and I think he fell in love with us too, because uh, y'all are just so lovable. That's the deal. Y'all are just so lovable. And so uh, that starts tonight and goes through Wednesday night, 6.30 every night, and I encourage you to come out. If you can't be here for some reason, you can always uh, jump online. We'll be, we'll be streaming it, but we'll all be from this location here at Flowing Wells. Uh, so I'd encourage you to come a little bit early because all of our services are going to be kind of in one room. Y'all follow what I'm saying. Get here early because it's going to be buck wild. Amen. The other reason today I feel like is an exciting day for us is because uh, of the message content I feel like the Lord has led me to preach on. I shared this last week. I jokingly thought about it. I thought last week I shared that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to minister on the election. And I thought, well, that'll, that'll either cause people to show up or cause people not to show up one way or the other. And either way, I'm good with it because I'm, I'm here today to fulfill, I believe, the assignment that God has given me. This is a significant time um, in our nation. We are coming into an election, and elections matter. Amen. And so um, I want to begin, though, this message, though, with just sort of uh, challenging, perhaps, a thought process. I have a picture I want to show you on the screen. Um, And in this picture, uh, you'll notice it, it is the planet Earth. Yes, it's not a trick question. Some of you are like, "Uh, uh, uh, you'll burn me, man. I know how you are, right? Why don't you take a look at this picture of our globe, our home, our planet, uh, and you notice something perhaps a little odd about it? Do you? Some of you are like, some of you are like, you think it's one of those tests where you're like, you're supposed to see something else inside of the thing you see. It's not really. It's, it's pretty straightforward. There's nothing hidden. There's nothing. But if you look at this, it is what? So my question to you is simply this. Who says? Because the statement of upside down is a statement of perspective and position. Amen. The reason you believe this is upside down is because you are used to seeing um, this picture the other direction. And there's a reason why we see it that way. Actually, um, some of you are into a good conspiracy conspiracy theory. Uh, This is not really a conspiracy theory. It's the truth that the, the navigators, the sailors, those who originally designed the maps were all from the northern hemisphere. So when they drew it, they drew it from their perspective. And so if you were standing in Antarctica and you were looking at the globe, this would actually be the true perspective. And here's what I want you to understand about this, because the perspective that we get oftentimes in our culture and our world is one that is constantly just subtly being fed to us. 
But how you see it depends on where you stand. I heard these people. I didn't hear these people. It's all about where you stand. It is a matter of your position that determines your perspective. And while there was once a day, candidly, within the church world, that probably the vast majority of people, and I think this is fairly true still today, but the vast majority of people probably walked into church and they had this perspective about God's word, that it was infallible, that it was authoritative in nature. The truth is because, truthfully, we've gotten away from God's word, um, there has crept in another perspective that the world is pushing, and it is a perspective, candidly, there are some who would approach the scripture with what I would call a hermeneutic of suspicion. That somehow when you approach this Bible that you need to be suspicious of everything about it. Who wrote it, how they wrote it, when they wrote it, you know, are there books that are supposed to be in it that are not in it? And all of that is great conversation and we can have that conversation at some point. But there is a disposition that we are, we are gravitating towards. It's not recent. I go back to last week. It is a product of the Enlightenment in the 12th century, whereby we were taught that reason is found only within yourself, and you have no need of religion or belief, that skepticism, reason, and individualism is the thing that rules it all, which is what we're living in today. Amen. Amen. But I would challenge you today that, that as I preach on what I have called simply uh, the election message is what I'm calling today. And there's a reason why I am. I didn't come up with that. You're like, I hope not because that's not that, that's not that fantastic, Pastor. No, I'm literally calling it that because it is a throwback to an era of, of years gone by in our own country. As I begin to study and I begin to see, I begin to see that, that in, in, in the 1600s, 1633, that pastors, uh, as early as we can record, all the way back to 1615, actually, a- every year they would preach an annual message on the election. Now, I find that incredibly interesting because there wasn't an election every year, but they preached on the election every year. And what we typically tend to do is wait until there is a massive moment of election, as we are sitting in today, and suddenly begin to talk about the election. And it seems so strange to people that we would talk about such a thing in church. Now, here's what I would say. Why? Because there is that, that hermeneutic of or that interpretation of suspicion. How I, in turn, approach the Bible is simply this. It is a, I call it a hermeneutic of second naivete. What do I mean by that? You're like, that sounds weird. Well, it is a little bit, but here's what it means. It means that I can acknowledge that there can be intellectual challenges when I read Scripture. That I can look at Scripture and go, like, I don't, I don't, I don't see the historicity. I don't see the geography. I don't see how that could be possible. And the reality is it may be because of my limited understanding. It may be because of limited discovery. But here's the reality. I'm not reading the Bible for a history lesson. I'm not reading the Bible for a geography lesson. I'm reading the Bible to reveal the character of God and the nature of God to me. And so I approach it understanding that I can embrace intellectual challenges with it, but still understand it does exactly what God designed it to do, which is what? Reveal himself to mankind, reveal his heart, reveal even his commands, and his commands are connected to his character, so there's a reason. It's his character and for your good, but it's to reveal God to us, so it still accomplishes the wonder of it all, accomplishes what God has intended it for. It all depends on where you stand, my friend. And so today, as we dig into a concept and a conversation about elections and governments and politics, oh, all kinds, oh my, it sounds like lions, tigers, and bears, but, but as we dig into this conversation, there are some who would say, well, I just don't know why we would talk about it. Here, here's why we would talk about it, because I am not a fan of politics, um, but I am a person who understands the value of governments. Governments matter. Why? Because governments lead nations. Nations have an impact in our world, both spiritually and and practically in some regard. And so how those nations are led by said governments play a part even into our lives, our children's lives, and our children's children's lives. And so it's important our government and who, thank God, we have the opportunity to elect into those government positions. 
as I said, I am, I'm not about politics. If you take the word politics and you were to break it down and to study it, it is literally two words. It is the word poly, which means many, and it's the word ticks, which means blood-sucking animal. I'll be here all week. Okay. And that's about how we feel about politics. It's about how we heal. But, but here's the problem that I see that's happening in the church today, and for some of you this has already happened, is that you have been so inundated with the rhetoric, the, the lack of dignity, the name-calling, the, the lying, the, the casting of, of different pictures. You're, what, what it is all designed to do is to make you exhausted, to where you literally throw your hands up and you do nothing. The problem with that is this, and that is the vast majority of evangelical Christians. Seven out of ten do not vote. And, and so it's doing exactly what it's designed to do, to get you to just throw your hands up and go, it's too big, it's too much, how do I ever, I don't like any of them, come on somebody, right? And so how do I even navigate this world and all of this stuff? And I would say it this way, that we are as believers, given as all people, a, a, a responsibility, I believe, to steward the influence and even our spiritual influence, especially in moments like this. That there's a responsibility upon us to, to steward this. Now, I know, here's the thing. Let's just, everybody take a deep breath, right? Because I know there are some of you out there right now that are going to think this. You're going to think, pastors, you preach this. Some of you will think this. You, you went too far. I, I get that. And then there's another group of people who will think this, you didn't go far enough. I've already met those people. It's honestly interesting to me. I've already met those people in the foyer. And I'm just glad that I gave you language so you could joke about it with me instead of being obnoxious. Because there's some of you just want me just to like, to just, you know, be bombastic in my approach just to, to give the devil hell. Right? And you would love nothing more than that for me to, to, to lay that sort of approach. Here's the thing that, that my prayer is, is this, simply. My prayer is this, Lord, I want to be the man of peace in these moments. Peace can mean truth and grace. Peace means that we don't get rattled. Some of y'all get too rattled too easily. I had someone walk up to me in the, in the foyer a few weeks ago, and they were just like literally breathing hard, you know. And I thought, did you, did you run a mile, bro? What happened? And walks up to me, he's pastor. You know, he's talking about some different things. And then he said this. He said, this, this election is the most important election ever. And I was like, no, it's not. Because we said that four years and eight years and 16 years and 37 years. We've said that every year, and that's rhetoric that wears people out. It's not helping. Now, is it important? Absolutely. It is important enough that I would respond to what I believe is the prompting of the Lord to take a day and present to you an election message. Now, I said I didn't come up with that. I actually didn't because as I began to study through the history of the church and even the history of America, what I began to find was simply this. There was an element of people um, that, that were responsible in, in terms of preaching messages or what they would call an election message for the purpose of helping people to understand their government, to understand um, the, the morality, the expectation, and even to hold the government uh, uh, sort of accountable. Now, there are some obviously sitting in the room who say, Pastor, don't, you know, there's separation of church and state, and you should keep them separate. And my friend, I would simply just encourage you to study history because the separation of church and state does not mean that the church has nothing to say about the state, or candidly, the state has nothing to say about the church. What it means is that they are separate and never controlled by the other. Amen. Think about it for a moment. The men who, who framed our Constitution, the men who framed the Declaration of Independence, were people who had come away from England, and they had moved into this new land with this desire to not be overly taxed and overly taken advantage of, and also they wanted to be able to practice their religion, their freedom of religion, because in England, still to this day, there is a state-sanctioned church. And so they didn't want the church and the state, what we call Christendom, that what we would call Christianity in that sense of the state and the, and the church being together. They are separate. And I actually agree with that. 
I think that's the right way for us to go, that the church is the church. Because here's why. Every time the church and the state got together and they were in the same sort of bed together, it always led to corruption on both sides. Amen. Do your history. (laughs) And so the reality is this. It's not that we are not to talk or have an influence it's it's always shocked me that people would think that. I'm like, by the way, I'm an American citizen with voting rights and liberties and freedoms just like you. And so the reality is to say, you shouldn't talk about that while the Teamsters talk about it, while the unions talk about it, while every other nonprofit talks about it. But the church shouldn't talk about it because we just want a message to make us feel better and feel encouraged. Well, I am encouraged. I am encouraged because I believe that uh, God is in control. And I believe while this is important um, and it's a significant election on every level, uh, I believe that on November the 6th, I will wake up and lo and behold, God will still be in control. Amen. And so I want to talk for a second about this group called the Black Robe Regiment. The Black Robe Regiment is interesting. You can study it for yourself. It was actually a nickname that was given to the clergy and the preachers. These were, these were Protestants. These were Catholics. They were Lutheran and Methodist. And they were Presbyterians. They were Episcopalians. They were every sort of, uh, of denomination of Christianity. And, and what would happen is once a year, they would present an election message as a part of a lectionary. They would take time to pause and talk about the government, the state of the government, and what was going on. And, and elections. Now, there wasn't an election every year, which I find interesting. They had normalized this conversation that people just understood. Part of my Christianity is I need to steward my influence in my government and in my nation. Amen. But they got the nickname, the Black Robe Regiment. They actually got it from um, their, their former nation of England. And listen to what they said about the Black Robe Regiment. They said, if it had not been for the Black Robe Regiment, um, if it had not been for the clergy... America would still be a happy British colony today. They understood the influence of the pulpit and what it was having on people, not, not for war, but, but for independence and freedom and the right to, to, to worship and the freedom of speech and the freedom from, from overt taxation for the wealth of certain people. And so if you look back over your Declaration of Independence and if you were to study it, you would find that truthfully it is nothing more than a list of sermons that have been preached for the 20 years leading up to the American Revolution. You'll find that the pulpit was almost primary, they didn't come up out of a vacuum, these ideals of the Declaration of Independence. No, they came from the pulpit. Why is that? Here it is. Because I want you to understand, the concept of government, I believe, is ordained by God, and the reality of that government is our choice. Government is God's idea. What what do I mean? Well, think about it. When he established Israel as a nation, what did he do? He gave them commandments. He gave them taxes. He gave them properties. He gave them judges. He gave them um, ways to deal with foreign affairs, criminal law, health care. All of that is contained within the word of God of how he established the nation. So he didn't just say, you're a nation, do whatever. He established a very clear sort of system of government. Now, it was a theocracy, and he was their leader, but nonetheless, he gave them a plan. But here's the beauty. He didn't just do this to them. He did this with his people. Exodus chapter 18, listen to what he says. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, are trustworthy, hate bribes, place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and of ten. So God engages people and says, I'm going to establish government, and the reality of that government is your choice. You get to choose what kind of government will be in place. Are you seeing it? I love this because I went to 1 Samuel chapter 12 and I thought about King Saul. He obviously wasn't a great king in terms of his kingdom, his leadership. But listen to what the Bible says in 1 Samuel 12, 13. It says, and now behold, the king whom you have chosen. You see it. They came to God and they said, God, we want to be a nation like every other nation. We need a king. And God said, well, if I give you a king, if you choose a king, 
then, then he's going to take your land, he's going to take your money for, for, for taxes, he's going to take your sons for a, a, standing, war, a standing army, um, he's going to do things that, that have never been in place before. And he gave them all of sort of the consequences of having a king. And yet the people said, no, 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 we need to be like other nations, we can't be like everybody else, we need a king. We can't just serve God and follow God, we need a king, we need a king. And so God says, okay, I will give you, watch this, I will give you what you ask for. He says, the king, behold, the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. So God did what they asked for. Can I just tell you something? There was this thought that struck me. I think this this insight, I think the Lord, the Holy Spirit just really hit me with it this week, and that was this, is that part of the judgment of God is that he gives us the government we ask for or we vote for. Your children, my children, are growing up in a nation as a result of what we asked for. And you see, some of you think of the judgment of God as like, oh, God's going to smite us with, a, you know, with hurricanes and he's going to smite us with, with destroying the world and fire and all that. And, and while that certainly is designed, if you read the scriptures, there's a, a form of, of final judgment that God brings. But can I tell you, a lot of what we're living today is what we asked for. Y'all ain't got to amen me at once. It's okay. Even you Christians... You ask for by doing nothing. And so we live, candidly, in many regards, in the judgment of God. We're living here. He says, you chose the guy, I'll give you the king, just like you asked. And then what happened? Exactly what God, what God told him. He's going to take your sons, he's going to take your land, he's going to take your property, he's going to take everything you have. And he's going to lead you into war, and you're going to be subject to this guy. And by the way, it's interesting that anytime God chose, told them to choose for people to be in leadership, he said, look at their character. And I know this is the challenging part for us today. Because you're looking at the characters. I said it right, the characters. And thinking, where's the character? And here's what I tell you. Here's what I want you to know. Listen closely to me. Our system is broken. It is dysfunctional. It is not about serving the people. It is about serving lobbyists and means and ideals. A lot of it to deal with greed and money and corporate America. Hear me. And it is broken. Perhaps the brokenness of our system is part of the judgment of what we asked for. Amen. And so, as a believer, we, we... we have a responsibility. I, I love what Charles Finney, you have to understand, Charles Finney would have been a man that grew up listening to the speeches of George Washington and Samuel Adams. He probably would have been a part of this black robe regiment, and he says this, tremendously convicting. He says, if there's a decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible. If the public press lacks moral discrimination, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the church is degenerate and worldly, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in religion, the pulpit is responsible. If Satan rules in our hearts, our our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. Let us not ignore this fact, my dear brethren, but let us lay it to heart and be thoroughly awake to our responsibility in respect to the morals of this nation. We bear a responsibility. The pulpit is responsible. And we live in a world where the pulpit, even legally, has, there's been attempts to silence the voice of the pulpit as it relates to, to elections and to candidates. And so, this morning, I want to help you walk through this challenging season of an election and give you a few thoughts of how I will approach not only this election, but I believe as believers, we have a responsibility to approach it. Number one, I approach it with an understanding that I am, first and foremost, a follower of Christ. And in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, Paul writes, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male, there is no female, 
You are all one in Christ Jesus. What is Paul saying? Paul is obviously not eliminating gender or sex. Paul is not eliminating ethnicity or heritage. Paul is not even eliminating different religious sects. What he is saying is this, above it all, you are a follower of Christ. Before you are a Democrat or a Republican, you are a follower of Christ, my friend. You are a disciple of God. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. That is when I go into that voting booth or I fill out that mail-in ballot is the perspective I bring to it. I am voting as one who follows Christ. I am, I'm voting as one, first and foremost, as a believer, and because of my belief in God and my trust in his word, I will vote according to that principle that I'm a follower of Christ. Listen to this. First Peter chapter 2 says, but you are a chosen race, speaking to the church, a royal priesthood. He's not talking to the pastors. He's talking to the people. He's like, you're the priesthood. You represent God to people. People look at you, and they learn what God is about because you follow God. He says, you're the royal priesthood, a holy nation. Do you understand that you are a part of a holy nation even before you're a part of this nation? I I get so worn out with the American exceptionalism. And please hear me. I love this nation. I love the blessings of this nation. I I love what this nation has represented in some regard. It hasn't always got it right. It's got its problems, no doubt about it. But here's what I want you to understand. Before I am, bless God, I'm an American. Bless God, I'm a part of a holy nation in the kingdom of God. And then secondly to that, I can make, I'm a part of this nation, this heritage, this background. I'm a part of this party. I'm a part of this hobby group. Whatever it is, everything falls behind my serving Jesus. I am not a white Christian. I'm a Christian who's white. In case you didn't know. You follow what I'm saying? Some of you are like, you're red right now. I know, I'm preaching, bro. (laughs) Cut me some slack. Do you understand that? And what the world will try to do is it will try to try to, 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 to polarize and to pivot us against each other based off all of our differences. Listen, every nation, every tribe, every kingdom on the earth, God is a God of nations, and he says we will worship him together. Every tribe and tongue will lift, tongue will lift up the name of Jesus. So I love the fact that we're not all of one race or one particular ethnicity or one particular socioeconomic background, but I'm going to tell you all of that falls secondarily, third, fourth, to the fact that I'm a Christ follower. I'm a part of a holy nation. Listen to this. A people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. You see, no matter who your candidate, if they get elected or not, God, the God of nations, is still in control. He's still God. And I still serve him. There will never be a perfect candidate. Jesus isn't running. And so what do we do? Well, in times like this, we've got to look at his word, his scripture to guide us, his Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and lead us into truth about how do we navigate this. And so today, there are a number of issues that we are facing um, in just over a month. And here's what I would say to you. There are so many issues that people can get very overwhelmed. And so what my heart is today is to address a few of what I feel like are very clearly, explicitly outlined perspectives in Scripture that should help guide us in this decision. Now, I know when I say this, there are some of you going to say, well, what about this? What about borders? And what about, what about racism? And what about, you know, what about welfare? Or what about economics? Or what about, you know, uh, you know, build a wall or don't build a wall? And again, those are all great issues. And they can be on your list. That's the beauty of this. Because there are different things that matter to different people, for sure. And they can be. And they should be. So we say, well, what about Israel? And I would say, well, the Bible tells us, you know, if you bless Israel, <laughs> you'll be blessed. And so we always look to those who align with Israel. Well, at this point, they all say they do. So I'll just give you a little tip right here, is that if they all say they do, then I would pay attention to how they treat Israel's enemies. Amen. But again, for the sake of time, because I could, sp- I could keep you all here for days. Yeah, you know I could, and you don't want that. But for the sake of time, I want to address a few that I think are especially pertinent, not only for our nation, but our state. Number one is the issue of abortion. 
the issue of abortion. There are a number of propositions on the ballot, and one, probably the main takeaway from this whole election is the issue of abortion. Roe v. Wade was overturned as a federal law and then passed to the states uh, for the states to begin to regulate. So what this has enacted is this whole fear-based sort of thing that's happening at the state's level where every state is now you know, trying to bolster, or there are, there are organizations within a state that are trying to bolster abo- abortion laws uh, at the state level. By the way, please understand, we are a republic, not a, de- a democracy. And why that is important, listen to me, a democracy, in a democracy, the majority rules. The problem with that, <laughs> some of you are like, I didn't come to church for a, a, a you know, poli- or what is it, uh, political science, but, but here's the thing, the problem with that is this, in your urban centers of America, California, New York, if you go popular opinion, you'll lose every time. And so the way the government was designed was for you to have the most Local governance, this is why it's not just about the president. As a matter of fact, it's about our governors. The governor's not running this election. It's about judges. It's about school boards. It's about city leaders because those are the people that have the greatest impact and the greatest proximity and the greatest ear to what we are saying. And so we, we put all our focus on one election and we think all the rest, like all the rest of them just don't, I don't even know who that guy is. That's why you need a voter guide to figure out who that guy or that gal is because you need to understand they're most closely related to you and will affect your life the greatest. The schools, the things that we choose and we take for granted sometimes, they can be changed locally and abortion is one of those issues. Now I gotta tell you, <clears throat> I think you probably would assume given what I have said before, but, but I wanna walk through this issue of abortion. Number one, uh, I would say this, it is Proposition 139, which simply, it, it, is a, it is not, we already have an abortion law on the books. It actually is a 15-week from gestation period um, abortion law through the first trimester that abortion for any reason, I'm, I don't like it, I'm not pro-abortion, hear me, but it's already there. Here's the question you have to ask yourself, why are these organizations spending $15 million in the state of Arizona to lengthen the ability of abortion until birth. Why? Because all of these ideas of like, well, it's about you know, rape and incest and it's all about, and listen, my heart goes out to anybody who's gone through such a, a tragic, traumatic, evil, demonic experience. But let's be, let's be integrous about this. That's not the vast majority of the 50 million babies that have been aborted in America today. So we are pulling red herring arguments to try to pull the heartstrings of people. Let's get down to what it really is. I can't figure out why this law is even needed, but it's there. Now, let me say something to you. $15 million, organizations like Planned Parenthood. By the way, I got this off their flyer. They sent it to the wrong person, okay? And so... (laughs) They need to check their lists. And so, <laughs> don't send it to that dude, you know? I was walking down, down um, this last week, and this young, young man, super passionate, he's like, hey, man, I need, I need to talk to you for a second. And I was like, I didn't know if he was a part of the church or not, so I'm like, I'm like I gotta be nice, right? And so, I'm like, well, walk with me. And he's there to get people to sign up to vote. And a young man, in his probably college age, and I was actually like, good for you, man. Good for you that you give a rip around this nation. I don't know what he's going to vote. I don't care. I was like, good for you that you care enough to, to, bo- to bother me downtown to get me to it. And I said to him, listen to what he said. He said, I said to him, I said, I'm going to vote, man. He goes, I know, but it's not about you. It's about everybody else around you. I thought, my, my, my. Pastor, we don't want to talk about politics in the church. All the while, the, the world is understanding the gravity of these sorts of moments. So understand, why spend $15 million? Number one, let me, let me walk through this. Exodus chapter 20, one of the big 10, it says, thou shalt not commit, you will not commit murder. I think especially of those without a voice, those of innocence, there can be nothing more innocent than an unborn child that is created in the image of God. And so I would say to you, it's, it's pretty clear. You, you don't have to do a lot of deep exegesis to understand God's appreciation for the value of life that he is a part of. It is so interesting to me. Prop 139, it, it immediately invoked in me a scripture, Psalms 139. Listen closely. Psalms 139, put it on the screens. It says this, for, I, for you formed me in my inward parts. 
David is writing this Psalms and he's saying, in the, the, he, what he says is the delicate parts of me. You formed me, God, in my mother's womb. He says, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. He literally acknowledges that God and the image of God is there at the moment of conception, even within the womb of a mother. God cares about life. Now listen to me. Um, I know there are people in, in a room this size and online, there are some of you who've gone through abortions. There's some of you who've paid for abortions for a girlfriend or a spouse. And please hear me, there is no condemnation coming from this platform. There is nothing but the grace of God. The truth is for everyone, listen closely. I know you want to clap because you agree. Just, I want you to hear this because there are people out there that are getting triggered, right? And I'm not aiming to trigger you. That's not my goal. I'm not here to trigger you. I will trigger you probably. And just because I trigger you doesn't mean I'm trying to trigger you and it doesn't mean that I'm wrong. Amen? And so um, the thing I would say to you is this. What, what I want to convey to you is the grace of God that says this, there is forgiveness, there is restoration, there is healing. I can't tell you the number of women that have gone through abortions that I didn't even know they went through, and then I say something like I said a few weeks ago, and they come to me, and they're like, Pastor, tears, and still, this happened decades ago, tears in their eyes, their hearts are broken, and I feel for that. I go, God, what a, what a, what a devastating, the place they were in, the decision they made, the choices they made. Oh, God, just let your love and your grace and your mercy affirm that you love them still. And here's the reality. They will be re- reunited because that baby is in heaven, and they will see that child one day. That is the heart. As a Christ follower, that's what I believe. But I got to tell you something. I, I have a hard time understanding why is it that we need an unlimited abortion um, with, with medical care all the way up to the, to the point of even birth if, if desired for, for, for a, a, a doctor can say it? And here's the problem. There will always be a doctor. There's always going to be a Margaret Sanger in the mix. Some of you don't know Margaret Sanger. Well, let me introduce you to Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger is the founder of what you know of today as Planned Parenthood. She started in the 30s, and she started, and it always begins under the guise of birth control and family planning, and it always ends up in abortion. The number one product of Planned Parenthood today is abortion. They will tell you it's, you know, we're, we're birth care, Medicare, all these, all these things, that they, and they certainly probably do provide some of that, and that's a great thing. But I'm telling you, the reality is this. They are spending $15 million in our, in our state, not so they can pass out, they can pass out birth control pills. The only thing I could come to, and forgive me, I'm, I'm trying real hard not to get on a soapbox because I don't want to get in the way of the message, but I got to tell you, the only thing I can look at and go like, why are they spending $15 million in a state that already has an abortion law on the books and it can only mean to me like abortion is apparently big money. But I think there's something even more nefarious at work than, than just a money machine, and I think it's there. But I think there's something more because if you understand who Margaret Sanger is, and, and I've, I've referenced these on the screen so you can look them up for yourself because I wouldn't want anybody to, to not be able to find this for themselves. It was in April of 1932 at the, at the Birth Control Review, she wrote this. Birth control must lead ultimately to a cleaner race. I wonder what she means by that. Well, why would she use the word race? I mean, she could have said, you know, birth control you know, should lead to a healthier people. She makes it really clear. And, and she says in many other instances, it's not the only one, but probably one of her most uh, inflammatory statements is simply this. It's written in the uh, New York Publishing Company, Woman, Morality, and Birth Control out of New York, 1922. Page 12, she says this. We should hire three or four colored ministers. This is a conversation she had about, about their plans. They would go into, um, they would go into communities, African-American communities primarily, and they would pay for a tent revival for the churches, but they would, they would ask the preacher to, to allow them to set up a secondary tent that the women would have to pass through, and the men, but primarily the women would have to pass through for sterilization and for birth control before they would go into the revival. Listen to what she says. We should hire three or four colored ministers, preferably social service backgrounds, with, an engaging, with engaging personalities. The most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. We don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. 
And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. I tell you what I really believe. I believe that if you really want to get partially at the root of racism, you have to deal with the issue of abortion. Because the foundation of the most popular um, abortion-centric centers on the planet and in, in the country today are those of Planned Parenthood. And in the roots of it, there are the roots of racism. You say, well, pastor, that's all. Because I would say this, once that became popular, Planned Parenthood, man, they, their pundits went to work trying, no, 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 that's not really what she meant. She was just, she was just kind of talking out of pocket, you know, and, and all the things. I mean, I looked, and, and I've seen this for years, for decades, I've seen this article, so this is not new. And then I saw recently how much Planned Parent work they're trying to do to, to like, no, 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 it's just, you know, it's not really that. You know, just, she was just kind of talking about, like, we don't want them to get this idea. But the problem is, is this, is because in other instances, she She's been quoted as calling African Americans the weeds of society. She was a eugenicist that she studied under the Nazi regime. So I'm telling you, there are problems here, folks. In any other world, she would have been canceled. You see, you say, well, that's just coincidence. Okay, it's coincidence. Well, then help me with this. Planned Parenthood still targets minority communities as of 2015. It's 10 years. 80% of surgical abortion facilities are located within walking distance of a minority neighborhood. According to the Guttmeyer Institute, 2014, a year when black women only accounted for about 13% of the U.S. population, they made up 20% of those having abortions. Now, I could take all that and go like, well, that's just, that's a funny coincidence, Pastor. I don't believe it is. But then I look at this. I go, Margaret Sanger, her very first clinic, um, she launched her very first birth control and family planning clinic in a neighborhood in Brooklyn. I think it was Brownstone or something, and it's primarily an African-American community. She launched it there in that community. Accident? I, I don't think so. You could say, well, maybe she just found a good building. But then the next place that Margaret Sanger moved, you know where it was? Tucson, Arizona. She moved to Tucson because she had a child with, I think, tuberculosis, and everybody used to move to Arizona to take care of the breathing issues. So she came to Tucson. And so she didn't just come here and retire. What did she do? She opened up another birth control and a, uh, uh, birth control and a uh, uh, family planning center, abortion clinic, uh, in the barrio in Tucson, Arizona. And she named it this, the, forgive me, I'm going to botch this, but just love your pastor anyways, the Clinica para Madres. which means the clinic for mothers in Spanish. Find that interesting. And so I would say to you, um, I believe in the image of God, the Imagio Dei, that every person is created intrinsically in the image of God. Whether you accept that or not, that's certainly up to you. Whether you live out the potential that God has placed inside of you is up to you. But my friend, you were created in the image of God. Every child is created in the image of God with the value of God placed upon the purpose of God, the destiny of God. Time and time again, we see the, 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 the children in the womb leaping and having purpose and destiny placed upon them, even in their womb. Don't kid yourself. God values life. From the womb to the hospice center, to the nursing home, he values life. Number two, I'd say this. I would, I would pay attention to judges. Elected judges and officials. Why? Deuteronomy chapter 16 says, You shall appoint judges and officers in all of your towns that the Lord God is giving you according to your tribes, that they shall judge the people with a righteous judgment. I realize it may be difficult for you to find somebody, but our fall too, far too often we are ignoring the local scene and, and buying into the idea that, well, the president's what matter. And it is important, but I'm gonna understand, I want you to understand that you need to dig in and know. This is why we give you the voter's guide, so you can understand the voting histories of people, understand their positions and how, what they take historically. Because because the greatest indicator of future behavior is past behavior. And so when we look at this, we understand these judges will interpret the laws that we will then live underneath. And it plays into every one of these other situations. Another exact example of this is I would pay attention to the, the values of marriage and family in America. Pay attention to the values of marriage and family. Um, we're now living in a day um, it's been 10 years roughly 
um, since, since same-sex marriage was in, endorsed in our country, and now it hasn't just stopped. We're now living in a day where family values are attacked, under attack in the sense that you have certain places where people are advocating for children to have gender reassigning surgeries. And, and, and I understand dysphoria, and I understand the difficulties and the brokenness in which we live. I understand the, the realities of what people are struggling with, and, and, and I, I have empathy for that. But I want you to understand something. There is something in, that, we, that we know instinctively that, you know, hey, listen, you can't drive a car till you're 16, but you can have a gender reassignment surgery at 8. There are some things that instinctively we know you cannot do because your frontal lobe is not developed to the place to understand the full remedy and the action of this decision. And yet we're living in a world where family values, Orthodox Christianity, biblical values are being attacked. You see, it's clear. Listen to what Hebrews says. It says, let the marriage, let marriage be held in honor amongst all and let the marriage bed be undefiled. He says, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. He's talking about hetero. He's talking about homosexual. He's talking about all of it. Amen. And so I want to encourage you. The institute and the, and the institution of marriage was established by God. Everybody listen. It was established by God. Please understand that even before the church, the institution of family and marriage was established by God. Even before the church was established. And so as we, as we look at this, we see through Scripture, God's plan for marriage is defined as being between one man and one woman. Jesus reiterated the same point in the New Testament, in the Gospels. And so prior to 2015, 31 states defined marriage the same way that the Bible defined it. 31 states. Only three states voted for same-sex marriage at that point. But on June the 26th, 2015, the Supreme Court forced a non-historic definition of marriage upon the entire nation. Amen. So understand this, that, that while states are ruling, suddenly in a moment you wake up and there is now a new law that is imposed, even with, nation, even with states who have made laws that represent a different view and a different perspective. And why do I say this? You know, because the thing is this, um, I was driving down the road the other day and I saw this, this, uh, this bumper sticker on the back of the car. You've seen him and it was like, love is love. Come on, you've seen that, like love is love, love is love, you know, love wins, love, love, all this love. And the problem is, is that we have, we have manipulated and misconstrued the idea of love as it's just an emotional feeling we have. Can I tell you that love is also a conscious choice of the will? Amen. That love is not just the, the idea that, well, I just feel a certain way, I gotta follow my feelings. Love is a conscious choice of the will. According to scripture, though, even love is actually a command. Listen to what he says, what God says in Deuteronomy. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. We are commanded to love God. You understand that? He didn't say, hey, wake up, and if you feel like it, you know, just love me. Because there's a lot of days you may wake up and be like, man, I don't feel the love of God, and I don't feel like I love God. I feel, But the reality is God says this, I command you to love me. Now, here's why I'm going here. Because when you go to the New Testament, Jesus says this, if you love me, keep my commandments. He actually tells us that part of our love is obeying him. Why are you saying all this, pastor? Because here's what I'm saying. That no matter what your sexual orientation, your attraction, whether it's heterosexual, homosexual, whatever it might be, it, whether it could be any, anything of the listings that are there today, every one of us are called to submit ourselves to the commands of God's word and to love God by obeying his word. The problem with the church sometimes, if I could be candid with you, is that we get focused on a particular sin, and man, we really go at it, while ignoring the sin that is rampant amongst the church today. Amen. And so what, what Jesus is saying is this, whatever my commandment is, part of loving me is obeying my commandments. Does that mean that, Pastor, I need to, to, you know, to not believe or not accept this identity? Can I just tell you something? Now, I think that what is so so devastating in our culture is that we have allowed a sexual orientation to become the complete identity of a person. Can I tell you, you are more than your sexuality. I am more than my sexuality. In an overcharged, sexualized community, we, like that's it. If that's it, then that's, and listen, 
Every one of us can have challenges and difficulties and struggles in our life, but it doesn't define who we are as a whole. Amen. And my heart is to be redemptive in this nature. People will ask me at times, they'll say, well, pastor, are you, you know, are, are you, are you, you know, welcoming and affirming? And I would say this, I hate the question because number one, it automatically positions you in a negative position if you say no, but number two, here's the truth. And I, and I'm okay with this. I cannot affirm what God's word doesn't affirm. At the end of the day, you have to understand there are six prohibitive scripture portions that deal with homosexuality, homosexuality in the negative. There are none that affirm it. You can't find any scripture that affirms homosexual practice. But you can find six that talk very clearly uh, about homosexuality and its, its, its sort of provisions against it. Are y'all hearing me? And so what we've done in the world is like, well, but you know, you feel, what does it matter? Love is love. And yes, love is a conscious choice and decision to say, God, I love you above even what, what I struggle with. I love you above even my own particular pet sin and desire. I love you with my own fracture, my own brokenness. I still love you, God, and I seek to obey you. Amen. Amen. Now listen, it's one of my favorite, my, my, my favorite scriptures. Listen closely. I love this. You see, when people ask me, are you a welcoming and affirming? Here's what I say to them. I say, we are a welcoming and mutually transforming church. What does that mean? That means we all got work to do in being transformed into the image of Jesus. And you don't get to choose your struggle. You don't get to choose your temptation. You don't get to pick your battles. Amen? Because the truth is this. If you could choose your, your struggles and your temptations, you probably wouldn't have chose some of the ones you struggle with. Be like, could I pass on that? And so the reality is to ascribe some, like, some choice in the matter. And again, I understand some people choose. Some people choose heterosexual sin. Yeah. Amen. And so no matter what your struggle, no matter what your challenge, what the difficulty may be, no matter no what the brokenness, the trauma of your life, listen, we believe that you, we, anybody is welcome here. And we are mutually transformed. We believe that the Holy Spirit is doing a deep work of sanctification and changing. Listen, he has changed the way I have thought over the last 20 years sitting in this church. He has transformed me, hopefully, into more of the image of Christ and becoming more and more holy like he is. Not perfect, but yet drawing me closer into his image. Let, let me give you one of those scriptures that, that Paul actually addresses. Listen to this closely. He says, don't you realize that those of you who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't fool yourselves. It's in 1 first, first Corinthians 6, 9. He says, those who indulge in sexual sin, who worship idols, who commit adultery, who are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality, are thieves, are greedy people, drunkards, abusive, and cheap people, none of these, he said, will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's not my favorite part. Some of you are like, man, pastor, that's kind of morbid. No, 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 here's my favorite part. Here's the favorite part of this. Listen closely. Some of you were just like that. That's what he says. He's talking to believers and he goes, some of you were thieves. Some of you were male prostitutes. Some of you were drunkards. Some of you struggled with homosexuality. Some of you struggled with, 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 with not paying your taxes and stealing. He says, some of you were just like that. But listen to what he says. He continues. But you were cleansed. You were made holy. You are made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. He says, that's the way you used to be, but that's not the way you are anymore. We've got this idea that this is the only area that cannot change. It's because the world is telling you, I'm telling you, the Scripture teaches us and shows us there is no sin so great that God cannot break it. There is no addiction in your life so strong that God can't free you. There's no, there's no brokenness in you that God can't heal you. He says, some of you are just like that, but you're not anymore. Amen, by the grace of God, you're not anymore. And finally, I'm gonna land this thing. The last thing I would really address, again, there's so much more climate, borders, and creation care, economy, and Israel. You could go on and on and on. But as I pray through this, I think we have to be aware of those in the area's candidates and their positions on religious freedoms and freedom of speech. I understand the double-edged sword of this nature that when you call for freedom of speech, you're going to get people who disagree with you who talk a lot. And that's okay. That's candidly really okay. 
It's, it's part of who we are as a nation that you can, that you can say things, that you can, you, can, you, can, you can have conversations, difficult conversations, even awkward conversations, and do it freely. I go to the book of Acts, and it says this, Acts chapter 4, the disciples, it says, so they called them and charged them not to speak, the religious legal leaders of the day. He said, charge them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. You've got to stop this Jesus stuff. And Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you've got to judge. He simply says this. He just says, you can give me a directive in the law of the land, but when that law violates God's law, then I'm going to choose to follow God's law. And that's really what the, the, the right of religious freedom is wrapped up in is that I can choose to worship God in the way. We gather together and we worship God in the way that we, we feel best honors him and, and best exalts him. And so he says, you choose whether it's right, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and what we have heard. It's interesting, if you read the, 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 the Constitution in different portions, it says this, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, over the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. I saw this in the last number of years, in the last probably two or three years, relative four years, as it related to COVID lockdowns. And, and I saw this. I literally sat in rooms with pastors in California who would say to me, they are, the government is telling me I've got to shut my church down um, and they are fining me every time we gather And I'm not talking about bombastic guys who are on the news just trying to, you know, drum up church attendance. I'm talking about guys who are sincerely trying to lead their congregations well. And they're saying they're telling me that if I if I meet with my church, um, they're going to take me to jail. They were to the point of we're going to arrest you and take you to jail, which is a complete violation of the freedom to worship. I know there are some say, but Pastor, they were trying to keep everybody healthy, trying nobody to get sick. Here's the problem I have with this: strip clubs were open. Bars were open, Walmart was open, Home Depot was essential, amen. And here's what I would say to you, but yet somehow the church needs to, needs to stop. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah, listen, I think it's, it, <laughs> I'm gonna get myself in trouble. Well, I just won't. And um, <laughs> this pastor is making a decision saying, Simply, we're going to gather and worship, which is not only our, our freedom, but it's actually the way we see God calling us to gather together and worship and encourage one another, equip one another. And, and if people want to stay home and watch online, they can do that. If they want to separate, they, you know, distance, they can do that. If they want to wear a mask, great. They, I don't care. But to take away that freedom. And I would tell you that, that in many regards, it was a bit of a test run to see how the church would respond. And I'm not, I'm not a big conspiracy guy, trust me, I'm really not. Um, but I'm going to tell you this, I think it is important that we protect even ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, the ability to worship, the ability to gather, the freedom to say the name of Jesus without repercussion. <laughs> Amen. Close with this. I close with this. Hey, listen, I love you. I love the flock that God has called me to shepherd and my heart is to do it well. And so if I've offended you, forgive me if I've offended you, but at times the word of God is offensive as sometimes it confronts us with things that are uncomfortable. And I know there's some of you like, pastor, you didn't go far enough. Save it, just save it. Next, next election message, you can preach it. Because here's what I purpose. I, I know there are some ministries who turn their whole church in this direction. And I purpose in my heart to say, you know what, God, I don't, I don't think that's your highest and best for us. I think we are the body of Christ gathering. After the election, we'll still be gathering. What I want you to see, here's what I want you to see out of your pastor, is consistency. I want you to see a man of peace who will speak truth with grace and live at peace. I don't need to be bombastic. 
I don't need to be antagonizing. There's nowhere in scripture that I'm called to be antagonizing. Amen. I'm called to make my, my witness sure. Now I understand for some of you, I'm antagonizing. I get it. I'm triggering you. I get it. But the reality is this. Here's, here's what I would say to you is I believe the long haul of what God wants to do in this church is people every week coming to this altar, giving their heart to Jesus, being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, being healed by the Holy Spirit, using their gifts, being equipped, being developed, growing, going out, multiplying themselves. That's the call of the church to equip the saints. But I believe it is appropriate to take time and to address, and simply I would say this, elections have consequences. Elections have consequences. And we are to steward our lives, our influence, including our vote. I do not believe that a political party will bring the move of God. I am not putting my eggs in that basket. I do believe we need a move of God. And of all people most likely, friends, listen, it is the church that can lead the way in leading our nation to a renewed sense of God's presence, a revival, if you will, of God's presence, a restoration of the goodness of God. If if of all people, it is us that God calls to be the example, to live the life, to, to walk outside of an election, inside of an election, in a way that honors God, that loves God and loves people. Amen. And so please understand something. I don't I don't know who's going to be elected, and I I don't expect that a massive revival is going to break out because of that person, him or her. But I do believe God wants to move in our nation because I believe God loves people, and I believe God loves to bring healing to those who are broken and freedom to captives, and I believe the name of Jesus is still above every other name. I believe the name of Jesus has power to it to transform lives. And so while we steward this moment and understand the consequences of an election, we trust in God knowing he's in control. So what do I ask? I just simply would close it with this. Number one, I'd say pray. Scripture teaches us this, if you would pray, humble yourself. Oh man, God help us. God help us to humble ourselves before you. To seek your face, to turn from our own sins. Lord, your word promises that you would hear us from heaven, that you would hear us, and that you would heal our lands. So much of what we're living in today, God, is a direct result of what we've asked for. And so, Lord, we repent of that, that we have asked for things that have not aligned with your heart. And so, God, even if we did nothing, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our negligence of the stewardship of what you've called us. Lord, I understand that you're bigger than any election. You're bigger than any office. Your will, you you are God who sits over the nations. You sit on the throne of heaven. And God, we trust you in that. But God, call us to pray. Amen? I call you to pray. I call you to ask God for wisdom. I I, I call you to ask God for a renewed mind, maybe a different perspective from we're used to seeing it. And then I would say practically register. Today is the last day you can register. Tomorrow is the deadline, rather. But if it's not postmarked by tomorrow and you're not registered, you cannot steward this portion of your life well. So I encourage you to register. I encourage you to get a voter's guide and understand candidates at every level. So when you walk into that booth or you fill out that ballot as a believer and a follower of Christ, you understand what you are voting for, what you are saying yes to. And then finally, simply, about a month from now, you vote. You vote early. You vote when you can. You vote. Amen? Can we all stand together? appreciate your heart today. I was doing some study on this, and um, you, you know what the motto for Arizona is? You know we have a state motto? Yeah. And it, it ain't, you know, go Wildcats. I mean, half of the state it is, but most of them are like loving devils. But you know what I'm saying? Like, you know what the motto for the state of Arizona is? God enriches. 
Isn't that awesome? That's one of you separation of church and state people. You'll have to wrestle with that one because our state motto is God and riches. You know what I think that is? I think that's a cry. I think it's a statement, but I think it's also a cry. It's a prayer. Do you understand you can have a statement and a prayer at the same time? I can say, God bless, and that's a statement, and it's a, it's a prayer at the same time. And I think that the founders of our nation, of, of, our, of our state, when they went to establish our state, for whatever reason, I think under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they, they had this disposition to say, we want God to enrich this place. But I'll tell you something, you can't expect God's enrichment when we live in opposition to God's ways. God just doesn't enrich because you tell him to. God honors his word. God honors his truth. God honors, you hear what I'm saying? Those who honor him. And so as we pray and we conclude our time today, I just want us to pray that God would in fact enrich our state. Not only our state, but our nation, but that that prayer, that statement that was etched into the beginnings of our state would become a reality that God, you would enrich this place with your presence. Father, we thank you uh, for the, the order and the gift of government that you've given us. And Lord, at the same time, we struggle, Lord, with the realities we live in. And so, Lord, I just pray for every person. Number one, I pray the peace of God. I pray you would cover their minds and their hearts. I pray that, Lord, you would speak, Lord, to the attentive ear. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear you. And Father, we do pray again that you would enrich the state of Arizona. Lord, help us to live and align ourselves in such a way that the enrichment of God would be released in not only our schools, our universities, our governments, our, our corporations. Lord, that the enrichment of God would be released in our cities, our states, that the enrichment of God would be released in our homes, our churches, Lord, our children, elementary schools, all the way to preschool, to our hospitals, that the enrichment of the power and the presence of God would be present unlike any other place. Lord, I know it's a bold, a bold request. I know it's a, an outlandish claim in some regard, but Lord, before all of that, would you help us to align ourselves with you? Lord, as we come to this election, I pray that the men and women of this church would be women and men of peace. That God, we would walk in a confidence and assurance to know that you are in control, that we don't have to be rattled by the circumstances or by the storm, but Lord, we can trust in you and we can vote our, our values. We can stand and steward our lives in a way, God, that blesses you and blesses your people. God, I pray a blessing upon each and every person here today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to invite our ministry team to come. And we're going to close this way today. If you have a need and you'd like prayer, maybe something that has stirred up in you in this message, maybe just a practical, physical, spiritual, emotional, physical, financial, whatever it is, we'd love to pray with you. You don't have to leave here. We'd love to agree with you in prayer. The ministry teams are here at every location. We're gonna open these altars and spend some time in worship. If you need to slip out, you can do that. But there's altars open, we'd love to pray with you today. God bless you, church. We'll see you tonight at 6.30, amen? 